One of the steps in phaco emulsification that can be rather intimidating is the technique of polishing the posterior capsule. It would be fair to say that ever so often, after performing the cortical wash, we are still left with cells stuck to the posterior capsule. It is important to understand that these residual cells themselves can cause a significant distortion of the postoperative visual acuity. Removal of the cells is therefore important, but very often we are sometimes tempted to just leave it behind because of the fear of damaging the posterior capsule should we attempt to remove those cells. In this video, I'd like to share with you the important tips and tricks in removal of the cells stuck onto the posterior capsule, which is performing a safe posterior capsular polish in a reproducible way so that you do not ever end up with damaging the posterior capsule whilst doing this step. Let's move to watching the video. Here's a patient with a grade 2 nuclear sclerosis with a suspected posterior polar cataract. It is of utmost importance that you always remember that your three initial steps, that is wound construction, the capsular excess, as well as the hydrodissection and rotation of the nucleus, should be flawless. Following the meticulous construction of the wounds and staining of the anterior capsule, I now proceed to perform the capsular rexes. I ensure that the rexes is no more than 5 mm because this is a suspected polar cataract. What you will now see me do is bury the hydrodissection cannula to a pre-desired depth and inject a jet of fluid to create a hydrodelineation. Now what the hydrodelineation does is demarcates the endonucleus that needs to be downsized and emulsified. We now move to the nucleus management. The principles of nucleus management in a polar cataract is one, you work with low flow settings and the technique that's being performed is that of a direct chop with lateral separation in situ. In this particular case, I've actually ended up doing a primary chop and both the two halves of the endonucleus are removed out of the bag and emulsified. As you can see here, by negating the need to actually rotate the nucleus, I've minimized any cause of stress to the capsular bag. Please note how I perform a viscofluid exchange at every step followed by a viscodissection of the epinucleus and finally the removal of the epinucleus with the epinucleus mode using the phaco probe. Upon the completion of the epinucleus removal, once more I perform a viscofluid exchange. I then proceed to performing the irrigation aspiration using the bimanual irrigation aspiration technique. And why I do prefer the bimanual irrigation aspiration is because it allows for significant ease of removal of the circumferential cortex from all 360 degrees. We now come to the end of the cortical aspiration, at the end of which you can actually notice there are significant cells attached to the central posterior capsule. Now here are the important considerations when you are considering performing a posterior capsular polish. To start with, please understand that it is an extension of the irrigation aspiration. However, 
since we are working so close to the posterior capsule at aiming to release the cells which are stuck to the posterior capsule and aspirate them, we clearly need to work with lower settings. So the settings that we work with are something like a flow of about 6 mm per minute and a vacuum of no more than 8 to 10 mm of mercury. The second important point to always remember is Completely insufflate the capsula bag with viscoelastic and attain a perfect focus on the cells lining the posterior capsule even prior to introduction of the irrigation aspiration cannula. Doing this will help you achieve a perfect focus onto the cells of the posterior capsule and upon the introduction of the irrigation and the aspiration, there will be no change in this focus. This minimizes the chances of you losing your focus during the posterior capsular polish. Now how does this really work? The irrigation cannula stays within the anterior chamber with the irrigation ports constantly facing the angle. The irrigation cannula also works like a lever that pulls on the eye in different directions to aid the ease of removal of the posterior capsular cells. The removal of the posterior capsular cells is facilitated with the aspiration cannula. Now note how the aspiration cannula merely goes and rubs against the posterior capsular cells. The aspiration port never faces posteriorly. It's always facing anteriorly and is in the line of sight of the surgeon. The mere mechanical rubbing of the tip of the aspiration cannula onto these cells lining the posterior capsule results in loosening of these cells and the aspiration afforded by the aspiration cannula is adequate to aspirate these loosened cells. This results in an adequate posterior capsular polish. Sometimes, however, you may be left with cells that are firmly adherent to the posterior capsule. You do not go and traumatize the posterior capsule in an attempt to removing them. In such a case, it's perhaps best to leave it alone and perform a YAG capsulotomy three months following this cataract surgery. Having completed the posterior capsule polish, I now proceed to introduce the IOL within the capsular bag, then remove all the excess viscoelastic, and finally I perform a stromal hydration, which brings me to the end of the surgery. I hope you found some of these insights useful.